This has been a challenging year for our community throughout the coronavirus pandemic. So much has changed in the way we communicate, the way we do business, the way we interact with each other. But there are still very important decisions that are being made in city government about the response to the pandemic and much more. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for elected officials in our community to speak directly with you, their constituents. Welcome to Ward Updates, a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Ottawa City Councillors. We talk about the issues arising from the pandemic that directly affect you, your neighbours, your families. Also, we'll share stories of how people throughout the city are rising to the occasion to help others. And we'll talk about some important issues outside the pandemic that are on the City Hall agenda as well. Our guest today is the City Councillor for Ward 5, West Carlton March, Eli El Shantiri. Eli, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Mark. How are you and your family, and how are the people of your community coping through this long ordeal? Well, my family and I were doing okay. I was uh, working from home, and sometimes uh, uh, I come to work in, uh, in my office in Kinburn. Uh, uh, the building is locked down, but uh, it's a better work environment for myself to be uh, in the office uh, in Kinburn. Uh, the community is doing okay. I, 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 if I like begin by thanking member of the community and specifically Vera Jones, this woman, she helped us uh, through the floods and the tornado by creating a, a savvy second, which is a place where people can drop their clothes and she cleaned them and, and give them back to community members. And I was so impressed. She started doing the, the mask at the beginning. So uh, perhaps David Smith uh, in, in my community who they have uh, kids uh, treatment center for young people, they didn't have any mask. And, and as you know, at the beginning, uh, no one seems to uh, can find those masks, but uh, uh, some uh, volunteer in my community, they organized themselves and they start making uh, those masks uh, under the leadership of Vera. And I, I believe she made at least a couple of thousand uh, masks uh, from the beginning of COVID. And we're talking back in early April when, you know, when there was shortage of masks and others. So, uh, as you know, rural community, Traditionally, they pull together, they, they like to help each other. Uh, we've been through enough disasters in our recent years. We had two floods, one 2017, one 2019, and a major yeah. tornado in Dan Robin in 2018. So somehow we're used to help each other and uh, work together. Yeah, if there's any community in our city that is ready for a crisis and has some uh, has some has some experience to draw on uh it's yours so no question about that and i'm not surprised people have been rallying together again um tell me a little bit about how it's affected uh constituents relationship with city hall and with you and with the way city government is communicated because obviously it's challenging when you can't get together for a community meeting when people uh, can't gather to talk about important changes, uh, things like that. So it does present a challenge, doesn't it? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. And, and a lot of the challenge uh, at, at the beginning is also uh, the distance. As you know, we are far from the city. We don't have public transportation. And uh, during COVID, when, when people were asked to stay home, uh, so we reached out to uh, uh, the Western Resource Center, Ottawa Western Resource Center, and uh, they help us. They help uh, some of the family. We organize uh, delivery. Uh, obviously, we cannot use volunteers to deliver uh, some of the, the grocery or the need to those family. But uh, staff from the uh, Western Resource Center, uh, they took it on themselves to, to help out. Uh, I mean, again, in, in a rural area, um, and I hope you don't get tired of me using the term, but in the rural area, a resident seems uh, they check on their neighbor, they check on their family member. We all know each other. Uh, as you know, I've been in the community for 32 years. I have a list of, uh, of residents who I reach out first to, to make sure they're okay or if they need uh, 
Uh, the food bank is operated in my building in Kimbrough, the former township office. So the Kimbrough Client Center had the food bank, has the savvy second, which is uh, provide closing for uh, people. Also, we have the, the police uh, uh, downstairs as well. So, so this building, it, it was pretty active during all disasters, especially now I open my office and try at the beginning to uh, to provide the connection with the food bank and uh, the savvy second and if someone needs something uh, of some kind of help uh, we try to connect uh, again uh, it changed the way we do business not everyone in the in the rural area have the technology or have the high speed internet to do zoom meeting or other uh, meeting via electronic but nevertheless we we still use the phone and sometimes uh, I drive by, drop off something to the resident, uh, whatever they need from the food bank in my building. And, uh, and uh, you know, and if something else they need, we, we try to help. So basically we manage and we manage well because uh, families also, also here, they look after families, they, they help their kids, their grandkids, their grandparents, so uh, help what was good. And my involvement, I, I would say with the small businesses was more unique than uh, other because uh, as the co-chair with the mayor uh, task force and economic recovery uh, I got quite a bit involved uh, citywide but most importantly I helped uh, the small businesses as you know I spent 33 years in a small business yeah uh, went to the yeah, I was going to ask you about that Eli I was going to ask you about what you know how businesses are coping and what else can be done to support businesses because it's obviously been a hard time for a lot of uh, companies that serve the public directly. And you're right. So the, the small businesses in in our community, we we try to work with uh, with the public health and provide them with the, the toolkit uh, to to help them to maintain the open uh, the, to take out uh, and delivery was very well received. Uh, quite a bit uh, business was doing very well. Uh, just to give you a little bit of example, sometimes uh, things work positively in, in those uh, worst circumstances. We have Ken, which is uh, uh, the, the, the winery in Carp, and they have 47 acres uh, of winery, and uh, they provide a food truck once a week, and sometimes it was twice a week. And we have resident uh, attend, and, and when I was speaking to the owner, he said, Eli, we have 47 acres patio here so just grab uh, bring your lawn chair if if, uh, if you like and go sit anywhere you like you pick up the, your beverage and your food from the food truck and uh, where we go so some of those business they did very well ridge rock brewery they were doing home delivery at the beginning of the lockdown and they did a tremendous business uh, delivering uh, their beer and they start making other uh, uh, beverages and they deliver them as well so there's some i have to tell you mark uh, and i know you're a you're a businessman yourself uh, i don't think we're gonna get go out of this COVID without a loss of some businesses the question is right. how much businesses we're gonna lose and how much or how many can we keep and maintain and 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 honestly, that's the that's the that's the million dollar question. How could we help, and how much can we help? Municipality has a limited; uh, they can help with. I mean, we can defer taxes. We can we can waive the fee for patios. We can allow patios uh, off season or longer season. Uh, the question is, all that is it going to be enough? And might not be enough. And and the federal government with their program. Uh, for the commercial uh, to reduce uh, or support rent support, uh, you have to remember the the landlord has to be willing to do this because they're yeah. going to lose 25 percent. And some of them, they are small landlord when it comes to uh, to some area. Like it's not everyone big franchise, and and that's going to have an impact on uh, uh, on a rent supplement. So uh, there is some challenge and and. I'm still working uh, on behalf of the mayor with the mayor on on his task force, and uh, we get we have quite a bit of partners, including the Ottawa Board of Trade and all BIAs and independent businesses. So we're working. We're trying our way. 
What are some of the other lessons, Eli, that you think arise from this crisis? What's going to change going forward? How will that impact how the city carries out its plans in the future? What are your thoughts on that? I believe, I believe we have to have some, some changes have to happen. And uh, if I wish I have a crystal ball to, to see how, how, how things will play out right now. The biggest concern is uh, second wave. And, and we heard today uh, from the premier, uh, there starts scaling down on uh, and, and gathering or home gathering. And I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of home gathering because all along, you know, we were told stay with your bubble and, and we try our best to be with our bubble all this time. But as uh, as the time goes, you know, and, and that become a long period, I, I can see some of the young people, not just young people specifically, but majority of young people seem uh, going about just like nothing happening. And now we see the, right. the result. This morning we heard high school was shut down, which is the first high school uh, in the province. And that's not far from us. That's in Renfrew, just up basically what we call here up the line from us. Yeah, so do you think that there are going to be lasting changes as a result of this? Will it affect how the city plans going forward? Will it affect things like um, uh, where people live, uh, what we do with public transit, what we do with roads? Are, are, are those changes going to be significant? Or once there is a vaccine, will we largely go back to normal? Well, I mean, obviously, we're hoping for the vaccine to be sooner than later, but we keep hearing it's going to be some delay. Uh, but you're right, everything has to be reviewed on a regular basis. Where even with all the loss of revenue in Ulster Transport, we heard they have not reduced any, uh, uh, any, any area of business and they're still operating on a regular schedule. Uh, that has to be reviewed because the the lost revenue is tremendous and and even we hear all we can be compensated by other level of government is still the taxpayer has to pay uh, the money and also also the, the real estate is going to change uh, as we speak uh, today uh, we heard from large company like Shopify or, or other they they're doing their business from uh, from home uh, my nephew worked for insurance company and I was helping him to get a permit. They were going to build a seven story building in the west end of the city. Well, now that has been on hold indefinite because they figured their, their staff can work from home. And why should they have a real estate or offices and, and provide them? But at the end of the day, it's going to cost you more to do your job from home. It's going to cost you more internet, it's going to cost you more electricity, more usage of water and other. And I hope, you know, that's going to change. That's, you're right. It's not going to be the same even after we get the, the vaccine up and running. That, that's going to change. And, and the changes is going to, it's going to have a ripple effect, not just on, on the real estate. <coughs> Sorry not just on the real estate is going to have an impact on the businesses the, the 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 store the small business the restaurants you name it in those uh, buildings when people evacuate or people work from home what we do on elkin street or lorry or spark street or, yeah. or byward market all those area uh, i will be concerned and i am concerned quite honestly what about the financial burden of all of this on the city's finances uh there there is what do you think about taxes next year about where some of the shortfall will be made up uh, do you think that the city will be able to achieve a tax increase of three percent or less which is what the mayor promised in the last election what are your thoughts on that well right now uh, as you know uh, the financial of the city is uh, with 192 million uh, shortfall I know we recovered some from uh, from the provincial government, but not, it's not near enough. We're still over 40 million shortfall, which represent almost uh, 3% on its own because each 1% uh, generates 16 million. So uh, 
and 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 I hear loud and clear from the resident keep saying, why do we need the staff? Why don't we lay off some staff in a time like this? And I say, hey, you know, you you must be kidding me. It, that, that's not the time when you want to lay off staff. And when it comes to staff laying off staff, as you know, in the union environment, the first people. Uh, get laid off the people who do most of the work every day the one who drive the truck the one who drive the snow plow the one who cut the grass and the list goes on so really uh, mark we, we are looking for uh, for the federal government and for the provincial government to uh, to help out with with uh, since we cannot have a deficit to help out with the shortfall and at the same time we need to keep reviewing what's happening i mean uh, for how long you're going to be a $1 million shortfall a day, which is the city right now, is losing a $1 million in revenue, whether from transit or other revenue, recreation and other. So we might have to start look a uh, different way. Uh, transit, does it has to be uh, on a regular schedule or should we reduce schedule? Should, uh, should we reduce the number of trips? And, and I'm just, you know, we, we keep, we need to keep an eye on on day-to-day -day operation and hopefully we'll find we'll find a spot where we still provide a service to the community but things are going to change and, and we have to be a little bit patient i, I have to tell you uh, we're not getting call for less service every day we get call for more service we get more call for bylaws we get uh, more call for police we get more call for city uh, workers city staff fixing our road our power hole today people stay home or they're working from home and and they see traffic on their road and they want more traffic come i never install more speed boards in all my years on council than I did this year. Why? Because people are home during the day and they see the traffic on their street or they go walk with their family and they see, and this is all mostly local. We're not talking about people coming from uh, out of the province or out of the area, but nevertheless, we get call, more calls for service, not less. So we have to be careful when budget time and, and our residents say, well, why don't you reduce the service or cut the service? I like I like someone to tell me what's top three uh, cuts they would like to see and how much impact or effect is going to be on the community. All right, let's turn to a couple of other uh, issues that the city is grappling with right now. Uh, you're the former chair of the Ottawa Police Services Board, and I know these issues are still important to you as a member of the community and based on that experience that you've had. There's been a whole discussion around systemic racism in our society and about whether or not we should be allocating resources differently, maybe moving some dollars away from from law enforcement towards mental health services, have a different way of responding to some calls that now go to the police. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I was uh, probably the first counselor to speak about uh, defunding the police. Uh, I, I think that message is, is sends the wrong signal. In uh, 2006, under uh, Stephen Harper's government, they were offering uh, the 25,000 police officers in Canada. And most of the police leaders, including myself at the time, we said, that's wrong. We don't, we don't want you to give more policing, give the police more uh, training, on, which is very important, and also a member of the, 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 the social worker to be company with police officers. And I, I, I still remember the chief uh, of uh, Winnipeg at the time, sorry, I said 2006, that was in 2012, I believe, not six. And uh, uh, the chief of Winnipeg said, you can cut my budget by 10 million if you like, but before you cut my budget, hire me 30 social worker, like qualified social worker, expert in mental health and addiction, and, and, and I will be happy to reduce my members uh, by that time. So, 30% of call for service mark in the province, not just in Ottawa. And as you remember, I was the chair of the uh, provincial police boards for three and a half years. So I have the knowledge across the province. 30% of the call for service cr across Ontario was for mental health. So, and police, I agree with you, and I agree with anyone who say they're not qualified and they're not trained to be 
a mental health worker. You have to remember they only go 12 to 13 weeks in, in, in Elmer Police College and we expect them to be expert in everything, in traffic, in conflict resolution, in, in domestic, and, and now we expect them to be in mental health and then use of force. Well, I agree with the sentiment we should train other people to take this job and I'm, I'm for that. But until you do such a time, who's going to take the calls? Who will take the calls after 5 p.m. when all these institutions right now close down? Who take those calls on a weekend? It'll end up being the police. And I'm not saying the police is the right people to do it. I, I've been, I was saying this for the last uh, eight years. A police is not trained or, you know, or qualified to be a mental health professional. There's other people who has more expertise than police for, for mental health and addiction. And, 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 and the problem is they're, they're not there. We haven't made the investment to create those uh, folks who are, can be helpful to the police. So when we say let's defund the police and give it to other group, but I'm not sure if that, which one should go first. If I, if I was still making that decision, I would say, no, let's, let's have a training for the police officer on one hand, and other we, we, we have civilian who, who are qualified for mental health and addiction to be taking some of those calls and, and accompany the police. Because the rules right now in Ontario, even if you have a mental health uh, individual or addiction, you arrest them and you go to the Royal Hospital, it's not just one police officer has to be there. You have to have two police officers there. And the last time I checked how long the waiting list is minimum between 60 to 90 minutes, the police has to wait with, uh, with their patient at the Royal Hospital to be released. So, I mean, how could, you know, it's the wrong time even to suggest defunding the police. As a matter of fact, this is the time when we want to make investment. You're right. Uh, police that uh, does have uh, racism in in, uh, in in policing in in everywhere not just in policing but let's be honest about this racism everywhere we feel it we see it uh, I mean I don't know uh, some people call me oh Eli is a brown person somebody call no he's not uh, brown or whatever but I mean racism exists and we felt it and we dealt with it in in the past and still going to exist with us for a long time until we all come together and say, let's deal with this. Let's, 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 let's talk about it. And let's talk about it honestly and openly. But to suggest sure. uh, at this time uh, to, to defund is, is the wrong time, absolutely the wrong time. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a lot there. And, and I, some people are saying, look, uh, you know, some people are, are talking about very drastic defunding. Other people are saying, let's let's steer some resources away to other areas uh, where, as you described it, the money might be better uh, used and there might be people more qualified to handle the things that police are being called to. But when you talk about the issue of racism, um, what, what can we do as a community to address that? From a person who arrived in Canada, Mark, in 1975, who didn't speak a word of English or not much French either at the time. Uh, when you come in, you feel it sometimes. It's there, it's in people's mind. When, I mean, if, you know, it, it, is, it is in every uh, department probably, in every professional, and, but I mean, it, it is there. But how to, in my opinion, when we talk about it and, and we talk about it openly and we'll be honest about what we're saying, I mean, right now, when I listen to what's happening and, and you know, we're upset with the history and we want to tackle the statues of uh, Sir uh, A. Johnny McDonough, I mean, I can't help but to say, well, that, that's our history. And if that history taught us something, why, why get rid of it? Why don't we... Uh, you know, why, why don't we we deal with it? Why don't we educate our kids? When when we walk by Sir A. Johnny McDonough, we can tell him this is our first prime minister. He's the, he's the godfather of the country. And he did some mistake. And yes, he did something wrong to the indigenous community. And, and hopefully we'll learn from that and would never happen again. But to suggest, like, I, I, what I'm finding, oh, let's deal with racism. Let, let's, let's bring... Uh, people of color or people of visible minority to certain job and, and that will 
Well, I don't think they will solve the problem, in my opinion. What would solve the problem if we are talking about it and if we are dealing with it and if we speak openly about it? And and what what was my challenge? At, you know, should I sit back and say, "Oh, people making fun of me because I don't speak English," or I'll just take that and go to uh, night school, learn to speak English, uh, did my best, go back to school? I mean, uh, honestly, th there's a different ways. Uh, to to deal with the racism, and I'm not saying what took place in in United States acceptable by all means. We all understand that, but in 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 our right. own sort, but in our own here and on all what we can do as an individual, I think we all have to reach to each other and 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 talk about this and and attend the yeah. same church, attend the same picnic, uh, talk about this, let our kids play together. Right? I'm sure your young son doesn't know the difference between a uh, Lebanese person or or any other race as a matter of fact. Great points. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, only about 30 to 45 seconds, but just a quick thought from you on the discussion around ward boundaries, because it often ends up becoming in part about the whole issue of rural representation versus suburban and urban representation. Well, we, as, as we have to by the province and mandated to change the boundary every every three election, and now we've been over three election. The last time the World Boundary Review was in 2005. It's not going to have much impact, uh, basically, on on, uh, on a rural area. In the last, I would say, in the last 10 years, uh, Cumberland area, which is the subject now, has always been 75 suburban, 25 rural. And uh, with this new recommendation, and we heard it time and time again, Rural residents like to stay with rural residents because we share right. the comedy of uh, uh, rural lifestyles. So, uh, so now all the recommendation, all six recommendations, recommend rural Cumberland to be with Oscar. And uh, and I know some people say, "Oh, we're going to lose our identity." And you know, I, I've been on council long enough, and right now uh, we get elected in our ward. Reality is, we are city council. All our decision is a citywide decision, and right. all our involvement is a citywide involvement. So I don't believe that will change okay. much that will work. Eli El Shantiri, thank you so much for your time today. Best of luck to you and your constituents. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. Eli El Shantiri, the city councillor for Ward 5, West Carlton, March. Thank you for watching our Ward Update. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Spirit spoke directly to every teenager frustrated with how the world was treating them. But were they listening? The anthem was actually born out of Kurt Cobain's disgust for what he called a generation of apathy and spinelessness. Oh well, whatever. Never mind. Nirvana lives on the capital of rock.